Hello, and welcome to the Heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, we are going to talk about perseverance and prayer and about St. Monica and St. Augustine. And we're going to release this podcast just a few days early because um, we have the feast days of St. Monica and St. Augustine coming up here. And I really wanted to do something to touch on their lives, on what Jesus first says about perseverance and prayer, and then how St. Monica lived this. And through all of her suffering and all of her prayer, she won for us not only, um, she not only won Augustine's soul for God, but she won for us, St. Augustine, who is a great doctor of the church and a great example for all of us. And I don't have a beautiful image of St. Monica or St. Augustine. And so what I did is I decided to sit here by this icon of Our Lady with Jesus. And it's because they are an image of a mother and a son whose hearts, look at, they have one heart between them. And St. Thomas Aquinas says that, you know, when you have people who are spiritual friends who are really close, um, sometimes it's almost like one heart in two bodies and rarely, but sometimes it happens within family. And it's very true between St. Monica and St. Augustine. They shared almost one heart. And even when St. Augustine was far away and dirtied in sin and cold and broken, um, St. Monica stayed near him in her heart. And she carried his heart to the Lord and she, you know, placed his heart beneath the tabernacle and under the cross and asked Jesus to bleed upon him, to heal him, to change him, to warm him. And the blood of Christ did that. Um, and it's really beautiful because when I was at Notre Dame, I took a theology class um, by Father Daly and we studied St. Augustine, and I had to choose a topic of Augustine's writings to do one of my final papers on. And what I chose was the tears of St. Monica. And the presence of St. Monica's tears and the writing of Augustine, and then the power of her tears, and how it was these motherly tears so pure and selfless in love that won Augustine for God, right? that followed, you know, everything that Jesus taught about prayer and faith and perseverance, um, we can see in action in St. Monica regarding St. Augustine. And so I'm going to share some with you from that paper as well. So we'll talk about perseverance and prayer, and we'll talk about St. Monica, and we'll talk about St. Augustine. And I popped right here as well, you know, this statue of Our Lady of Sorrows. And you can see Our Lady's tears in this icon even. And she reminds us of those tears of St. Monica that were united to her perfect immaculate tears under the cross. And, you know, it's never our suffering itself that has any merit, but it's when we unite our suffering to Jesus in his passion and his mother perfectly, you know, living that compassion with him. And so... They are a beautiful image to look at as we talk about all of this. So at the beginning, we'll start with, oopsie, just a song, um, Seek Ye First, because it has those words of Jesus about prayer. And then we'll go on with um, the podcast. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be recreated, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. to 
I guess I should have tried to play it. Sorry for the mistake there. Seek Ye First is the first song I ever learned on the guitar 25 years ago. So I'm really tired. I thought I wasn't going to have to practice, but that just made it worse. <laughs> Seek Ye First, the Kingdom of Heaven, though. It's such a beautiful song because it contains all of those scriptures that Jesus gives us about um, perseverance and prayer, right? So, and trust, you know, there's two virtues that I see so powerfully in St. Monica, you know, as we begin here, one is perseverance. She didn't give up. I think she had to pray. I have it written down here somewhere. I think it was 17 years um, that she had to pray before Augustine converted. That's a long time. It's a long time. It can be weary on the heart when the person that you're praying for almost seems to get worse than better but she persevered. And then trust. Trust that her prayers weren't just like dust in the wind, you know, or, you know, drowned out by the cries of the rest of the world, that her, her tears were actually going to the heart of God and piercing him and causing a difference in the life of her son. Those are two virtues that we, um, really see clearly perseverance and trust. And those are what we want to take from St. Monica. And, you know, if God had um, answered her prayers right first at the beginning, um, we may have had St. Augustine, but we wouldn't have had St. Monica. Monica earned her sanctity through that exercise of faith and hope and love all of those years. So um, we see perseverance, we see trust, and um, the prayer and the sacrifice that went along with her prayer. You know, St. Monica was truly a mother of tears. And somewhere here in um, Augustine's writing, I'll share it with you in a minute, he talks about how she had to give birth to him twice, once in his body and once in his soul. And once, you know, when he, she gave birth to him physically, you know, the, the birth waters came out and he rushed forth. But in the second birth, it was the water of her tears that carried him to the font of the waters of baptism. And it was really beautiful analogy. Where did St. Monica get her courage and her strength to, um, you know, begin on this journey and then to continue on? And before we talk about her life, I want to just talk about Jesus himself and his teaching on prayer. Because he says really radical things to us in scripture. And if we remember it, then we would never be hopeless, like I talked about a few weeks ago. Because he makes great promises to us when we pray. You know, in Matthew, he starts right there towards the beginning of the Sermon of the Mount saying, Your Father knows what things you need of. Before you ask him, he knows. Right? Now, what does that mean? God is all powerful and he is all good. And he is all love. Think about a parent. If a parent knows that their child needs something and is upset and is hurting and that parent is full of love, that parent goes out and corrects that problem or prepares that for them even before the child can ask. I think about the children that I take care of. And so often, you know, sometimes they, um, they're too little to express their needs and sometimes they're too broken. But I see and I think, ah, oh, they need this. And they don't even know that they need it. But I prepare it all. I make sure it's clean and it's neat and it's tasty and it's on time and it's comfortable for them in life. And I'm just a nanny. Now think about the heart of their parent, their mother, who carried them that many years and or that many months in her womb. Somebody who's that bonded with them. And then transfer that times a jillion to the heart of God. God knows what we need before we ask him. And so Jesus teaches us how to pray when we come to him. He teaches us to say, our father, to call him that parent who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He teaches us to conform our hearts to the will of God. Whatever you know is best, you know my needs are. Whatever your will for my life is, let it be done, right? On earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is paradise. It's perfect. We pray for that taste of heaven on earth. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. Jesus says then, as the Sermon of the Mount goes on, ask and it will be given to you. He doesn't say put conditions on it. He promises, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. When you bang at the heart of God through prayer, he doesn't ignore you. St. Monica had to knock and knock and knock. And imagine her at the other side of the door of the heart of God and her tears, you know, falling so hard that, you know, the water starts seeping under the door. The Father's not ignoring those. Every tear, if every hair of our heads is counted by God, every tear is weighed in that scale and is used for our good and the good of those we pray for. Jesus promises everyone that asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks, the door is opened. Sometimes we don't even notice it or we take it for granted. But God is working in the presence, at present as soon as we ask. Which one of you would hand his son a stone when he asks for a loaf of bread? Or a snake when he asks for a fish? If you then who are wicked know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask of him? We see this profoundly in the life of St. Monica. And then it goes on later on in Matthew and it says, Jesus went from that place and withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman of that district came and called out, Have pity on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. He didn't say a word to her, and the disciples came and asked him, saying, Send her away. She keeps calling out after us. Jesus said to her in reply, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman came and did him homage anyway. She said, Lord, help me. Jesus said, It's not right to take the food of children and throw it to the dogs. And the woman said, please, Lord, for even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. Then Jesus said in reply, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that hour. You might be listening to this and saying, you know, St. Monica was a holy woman. I'm not holy. Why should God listen to me? I sometimes sin. I sometimes miss mass when I shouldn't. And yet, if you have great faith and you go to God and you ask him for help in a situation, he will not turn a dumb ear to you. He will respect your prayer. He will love you as his child, as his brother, as his sister. And he will grant what you're asking. Maybe not always in the way you're asking, because like you might be asking for something that's not good for you, but he will answer you, especially through grace. In Mark, Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive that you have received it and you will. It just takes that kind of faith. Believe and it will be granted to you. And in Luke, the Savior made this point in a parable about the friend who came knocking at the door at midnight asking for three loaves of bread. 
He said, the friend is desperate in need, but because of the hour, the man of the house says to his friend, trouble me not, the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and help thee. Jesus then said, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. The same thing is told in the Gospels about the persistent widow that keeps coming back to the judge every day. And he said, even if the judge doesn't do it because he has pity, he'll do it because she's persistent and annoying him. How much more does our Father in heaven who loves us, how much more does he want to get up and answer us when we're persistent in prayer? And so in Luke, again, Jesus says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, it is opened. Now which one of you fathers asks his son for a, will his son ask for a fish and instead gives him a snake? Or for an egg and his father give him a scorpion? So if you, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? So you might be praying and praying, praying for um, healing of cancer. And you'll say, God didn't heal me. I still have cancer. But do you have strength? Do you have grace? Did someone show up and pay your medical bill? Do you have peace in your heart? Are you able to pray through it? Are you able to use it for union with the Father as a prayer for somebody that you love? Jesus gives grace and answers to every prayer, just not always the way that we see, that we expect. And the apostles said to the Lord at one point, increase our faith. And Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. In another place he said, you know, you would be able to say to the mountains, be uprooted and fall into the sea, and it would happen. That's what faith and prayer can do. Another place we see the power of prayer is at the wedding of Cana. And on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for wa Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, draw out some water now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this at the beginning of his signs in Cana and Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him. And after this, he and his mother and brothers and disciples went down to Cap Capernaum and stayed there only a few days. Here we see how another mother, like Monica, is pleading for something from God. But who she's pleading to is she's asking the help of her son instead of asking, you know, for the conversion of her son. She's gone to him and said she's strengthening that relationship between all mothers and children by going to him and saying, son, there is no wine. I need your help. And he listens to those the, that plea, the tears of the heart of his mother. He says, you know, it's not even my time yet. But she says, I have faith. Do whatever he tells you. And so the heart of God, the heart of Jesus is moved by that faith and the prayers of Our Lady. 
Later on, many years later, Monica will go to God. And she will say, you know, there is no wine. There is no holiness in the heart of my son. And she will say to her son, do whatever Jesus tells you. And after many years of those words falling on Augustine's deaf ears, he will hear them and he will become a great saint. We see in the book of John, the Gospel of John, so many times where Jesus makes these powerful promises that our prayers will be heard, especially when we persevere in trust. He says, Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father and whatever you ask in my name, I will do. He doesn't say most things. He doesn't say something. Excuse me. He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything of me in my name, I will do it. Anything. That's just a promise. Anything you ask in my name, I will do. And later on in John again, he says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. It was not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Anything he will give you. And later on again, he says, on that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not tell you that I will ask the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you. Anything we ask, God will grant. So we need to take these words to heart in our own lives and apply them to our own lives. What is it weighing on your heart this week that you feel like is impossible? It could be a wayward child, spouse friend, some kind of a broken relationship, something that seems impossible. And what we need to do is to take these words and allow them to fill us with great faith and to go back to Jesus and to pray with that same perseverance, that same trust that we see him encourage us to have in these words and that we saw Monica have for Augustine. St. Augustine himself in his writings talks about St. Monica. He says, she, being Saint Monica, served her husband as her Lord and strove to gain him to you, O God, by speaking of you to him by her virtue. Saint Monica was married to a pagan who was violent, and his mother, her mother-in-law was also a violent pagan, and she preached to them through her virtue, by which you, Lord, rendered her beautiful and reverently lovely and admirable to her husband. She won her husband's heart through her virtue. She never resisted her husband by word or deed in his fits of anger. She waited until the storm was over for a proper occasion. And when many wives came to tell her all the disfigured things about their husbands to complain of their husband's conduct, she told them very resolutely to blame their own tongues. She wouldn't allow people to complain about their husbands, even if they were legitimately bad. She wanted them to be like her, to preach the gospel through her virtuous life. And eventually she won the conversion of her husband. In spite of every difficulty, Monica brought up her children in faith and in piety. And St. Augustine said, while yet a child, I had heard from St. Monica of the eternal life promised to us through the humiliation of our Lord, our God, who came down to cure our pride. She farther could never so, oops, sorry. My father could never so overcome in me the influence of my mother as to prevent me from believing in Christ. For she labored that you, my God, should be my father rather than he, 
And in this, you did assist her. So St. Augustine's father was trying to encourage him to be a pagan and to go away from God. And even though St. Augustine fell away in sin, he never stopped believing in Christ, he said. In another place, St. Augustine said, By your great mercy, O God, my tender heart imbibed with my mother's milk, the sweet name of Christ, your son, my savior, and ever after nothing, be it ever so learned, ever so polished, ever so true, could, if devoid of this name, entirely carry me away. Because of the mercy of God and the teaching of his mother, he never completely abandoned his belief in God. Partly, almost completely, Augustine was carried away in sin. And this was because of Monica's one fault. She deferred her child's baptism. And then she paid the price of 33 years anguish. Sometimes in that time, they would wait for baptism until later on in life when somebody had a lot of sin, right? <laughs> and she shouldn't have done that. And because of that, she had to wait 33 years for him to get baptized. St. Augustine was brilliant, proud, and high-spirited. And so he passed from he being a hero in the world to being zero. He was influenced by bad company. He became ashamed in being less wicked than others. He said, I was ashamed of not having done shameful things. That's really sad. And Monica's cup of bitterness seemed to be overflowing. Her brilliant son grown to a man's estate and seemed to have carefully rejected all of her teaching as a child. In the midst of it all, she found one ray of hope. And it was the famous line that St. Ambrose made to her. She went and she begged St. Ambrose, talk to my son, convert him, help him. And he said, why are you weeping? It is so sure that a child of so many tears will not perish. When he made that promise to St. Monica that her tears and her prayer would win Augustine back for God, she clung to it as that sole ray of hope. St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, was the only man who could have assisted St. Augustine, and he left St. Augustine to himself. He relied on the prayers of St. Monica to pull Augustine out of sin as opposed to his, you know, arguments that he could have made. St. Augustine said, often when we met, he and St. Ambrose, he used to break forth in praise of my Holy Mother, congratulating me on having such a mother, not knowing what a son she had in me who doubted all things. St. Ambrose knew in spite of Augustine's conviction to the contrary. But Ambrose was wise in the way of souls and his wisdom counseled him to be silent and to entrust Augustine's conversion, not to his own brilliant words and arguments, but to the tears and the persistent trustful prayer of his mother. Step by step, St. Augustine fought his way to the final conclusion that the Holy Scriptures and the Catholic Church had undoubted claim on his assent and his obedience. Then, suddenly, there was an incident of the conversion of St. Augustine when he um, was walking on a beach and he met a child and there was scripture there and he heard a word that the child, I think, said to him, which was, take up and read. And he picked up scriptures and he started to read. And he found in that reading of scripture um, happiness and the holes that existed in his life of pleasure and sin and debauchery, debauchery. And finally, Augustine succumbed to the influence of his holy mother and he turned to God and he said, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. Finally, the loving son who is 33 years old, brings the good news to the prematurely aged mother, and he asks for baptism. With his friend, who was a scholar, Alypius, he goes to St. Monica. In his own words, he says, 
Thence we go to my mother. We tell her everything. She leaps for joy and blesses you who are able to grant more than we can ask or imagine. For we saw that you had granted her for me far more than she had ever dared to ask for in all of her hopes, prayers, and tears. You had turned her mourning into joy much more perfectly than she had ever hoped. And before they arrived, St. Monica died from a sudden illness and her 33-year-old son sorrowfully, oh, before they arrived. So they were going to go back home. Sorry, I skipped when I put it here. And before they arrived back home, Monica died and her, th her 33-year-old son closed her eyes. And he said, these eyes had wept more for me than mothers weep over their child's dead bodies. This time it was the son who wept. He said, I cannot tell clearly enough what love she had for me and how with greater anguish she brought me forth in spirit than she had given me birth in the flesh. Now, there are some lessons that we can learn from St. Augustine and St. Monica, and then I'll share a little with you from my paper at Notre Dame. The first is that St. Monica's example converted her husband and her mother-in-law. St. Monica didn't preach. It was her example that draw, drew them to God. And then it was St. Ambrose said, we're going to leave the conversion of Augustine also to your example, to your prayers, to your suffering. And St. Ambrose didn't preach. So there may be situations in your life where you see someone who's either on the wrong path or maybe they just believe lies about something. And you might be tempted to go and explain the truth and be like, you know what? You are totally wrong in what you believe or what you see or what you say about me or about another situation. But sometimes our words won't penetrate a heart. What it needs to do is be entrusted to silence, to prayer, and sometimes to our suffering, to our tears. And then God takes that grace and he changes that heart. He, he heals the blindness, the spiritual blindness of people, the spiritual deafness, the wrong judgment. The second lesson is that St. Monica prayed for St. Augustine's conversion for 17 years. So like when he was a child, he wasn't that bad. That's why he was 33 when he was baptized. But for 17 years, he lived a terrible life. And she, he was living immorally. He was living with like mistresses and like he had a child out of wedlock and he'd leave one woman and stop sleeping with her to go live with another that he wouldn't even marry. And she was persistent in her prayer. Augustine kept rejecting her. He would lie to her and say, you know, tell her that he was going somewhere and go somewhere else. Or, you know, at one point he was sailing, I think it was for Rome and told her the wrong time because she wanted to go with him. And, and she ended up, you know, showing up on time to follow him, to plead with him, to come back to God. And the third lesson we can learn is that she was discouraged. Augustine was choosing concrete sin, but she never gave up. Monica had a dream once where she wept over her son and a figure appeared to her and told her that he was still with her. And in his autobiography, St. Augustine said, it was my soul doom that she was, my soul's doom that she was lamenting. In her dream, she was crying because he was on the path to hell. And the figure said to her, be at peace, see that where she was, there I also was. That don't worry because where you are, your son is. And later Augustine said, see what that means is that we're together. So you should become a pagan. And she said, no, no, no. The soul, you know, this figure in my dream didn't say you go where your son is. It said where you are, which is with God. He also is. And she was bringing him to God through her tears, through her prayer. And after she was, um, you know, very discouraged and she went to St. Ambrose and she was crying and begging him as only a woman, a mother can do. He said, go now, go now, I beg you, Monica. It is not possible that the son of so many tears should perish, which is such beautiful hope. 
The fourth lesson that we learned from St. Monica is she knew her purpose in life. She prayed and sacrificed for her husband's conversion and then for her son's conversion for many years. Her greatest desire was to see her son baptized and fully Catholic. She knew her purpose as a wife and a mother was to get her husband and children to heaven, right? And then once it happened, she died. She knew the purpose of her life was fulfilled. It was just to do this. And she could entrust Augustine to God after he had come back to God and she died. A few days before she came down with a fever and died, she said to Augustine, my son, Speaking of myself, nothing earthly delights me any longer. I do not know why I am still here or why I should remain here. I have no further earthly desire. So beautiful. So she knew her purpose in life and once she fulfilled it, she went to heaven. And the last lesson we can learn is she's the patron saint of wives of mothers, of conversions, of alcoholics. She struggled with drinking wine in the cellar. She'd get so distraught, I'm sure she's like, I just want a glass of wine, right? And she's also the patron saint of abuse victims because she was abused. But she used that abuse as a prayer and she won the conversion of her violent, angry husband, right? So we need to look to St. Monica for her example. Now I want to share with you some of the um, lessons that I learned on the tears of St. Monica and I wrote in this paper, October 6th, 1998. In the opening prayer for the votive mass for St. Monica, it says, God of mercy, comfort of those in sorrow, the tears of Monica moved you to convert her son Augustine to the faith of Christ. The tears of Monica. So they're even recognized in the votive mass for Monica. So when you find yourself crying, use those tears as a prayer. These mother's tears were sown in the core of her heart, where both her love of God and the love of her child resided. And they penetrated into the heart of God. She greatly put her trust in God. At the beginning of Augustine's confessions, he wrote, Lord, is there anyone, any mind so great, united to you by a strong love? Is there a man so devoutly united to you with mighty affection that he holds of small account, racks and hooks and various torments of the brute nature which in all countries, people with great terror pray to you that they may escape. They foreshadow, those words foreshadow in a way the character of St. Monica's heart and the role she would play pray in her li a son's life. Because she was so devoutly united with God, with a mighty affection that she held in small account the rack and hook and torments of the heart that she suffered for Augustine's conversion. Torments of the heart are harder to suffer than physical pain. And she, her desire for his conversion, she was willing to face. She was willing to be that martyr of heart. The blood of martyrs is the seed of faith. She was a martyr of heart that won for her son conversion. The wound of sin in the heart of her son was a wound of longing in the heart of his mother. You know, I was talking about how their hearts were one in this great love. And you would say, how is that true when he was off sinning and she was praying to God? It's because it was the same wound, but it was different. For him, it was the wound of sin. And for her, it was the remedy. It was the wound of longing of his conversion. And when the healing of the wound of sin took place in the heart of Augustine, the healing 
of that wound of longing was healed in the heart of Monica and her heart found peace. You know, Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. Monica's heart rested in God, but she wasn't at peace because her heart was one with Augustine and he didn't rest in God. When you love someone that ardently, your heart only finds peace when not only you rest in God, but they rest in God. In this way, the mother remains restless, not only until her individual heart rests with the Almighty, but also the heart of her son is safe in that bosom of Abraham. It's also written, I shall not pass over whatever my soul may bring to birth concerning your servant who brought me to birth both in her body so that I was born into the light of time and in her heart so that I was born into the light of eternity. This is Augustine writing about Monica. And you know, the prophet Isaiah said, run, I will carry you. I will see you through to the end and there I will carry you. Monica was living this in her tears. She was saying to her son, run, I will carry you to the fount of baptism. Throughout the, his whole life, Monica's heart ached for that gift for her son. And so she bore life to him twice, right? Once physical and once spiritual. Augustine said, she suffered greater pains in my spiritual pregnancy than when she bore me in the flesh. And, you know, Monica bore all of this, uh, this as a great cross in union with Christ. And she did it fiercely because of her love of God and her love of Augustine. It was love that caused this within her. One must realize that, ob that the objects of love often cause us tears and agony, right? That comes with love. And because of this, Monica's love brought forth many tears. But it was through tears that faith and hope and strength and conversion was brought to Gustin. Her tears were the fuel of her desire. Her love was the fuel of her tears. And so Monica continually lived with this burnt offering going on, on her heart, crying out to God for mercy for her son. He said, by my mother's tears, day and night, sacrifice was being offered to you, O Lord, from the blood of her heart, and you dealt with me in wonderful ways. And the gift of Monica's tears show her perseverance and her trust, right? Even when things looked bleakest, she continued persevering in trust. St. Augustine describes that during these times, Monica remained praying and weeping. By her flood of tears, she was begging God. She said, my mo he said, my mother stayed close by us in the clothing of a woman, but with a virile faith, an older woman's serenity, a mother's love and Christian devotion. Although it seemed often to Monica that God was ignoring her, he was simply answering her prayers in his own way, marvelously greater than she could ever have um, imagined. Augustine spoke about this to God saying, yet deep in your counsel, you heard the central point of my mother's longing, though not granting her what she then asked, namely, that you would make me what she continually prayed for. It felt like when Augustine left for Rome that her son was only getting more and more deep into sin. It would look more hopeless to her. God allowed her to be blind to all the work he was doing within the heart of Augustine in order that her faith would be strengthened. And that by not seeing the fruit, she could offer that as another suffering to move her son along. She was similar to the Blessed Mother when he, she lost Jesus those three days in the temple. Monica didn't understand the way Our Lady didn't understand. And Augustine says, she did not understand that you were to use my absence as a means of bringing her joy. 
Through all of this, Monica kept hope alive in her heart. She never gave up hope that the Father's mercy or hidden secret of providence was working in Augustine's life. She was trusting in the words of her Savior, whatever you ask in my name, I will do. She believed that nothing was impossible for God. Again, we see the quote by Augustine, in their weariness, they fall prostrate before this divine weakness, which rises and lifts them up. O oh Lord, you are our hope and our strength. He said, in my mother's heart, you had already begun your temple and the beginning of your holy habitation. Monica was so close to God, he already lived in her heart. And by continually loving and offering Augustine, she was keeping him close to that God who already lived within her. Sometimes God allows a soul to grow weary and to be drained of everything, because only when one is completely empty of themselves, God can begin to renew, restore, and fill the soul with his love, hope, strength, and joy. So he brought Monica to that pit where she had nothing else to offer but the tears of her heart. And then in that desolation, he filled all of her heart and all of Augustine's heart. On page 151 of the Confessions, Augustine speaks almost like it's about his mother. Cast yourself about him. Do not be afraid. He will not withdraw himself so that you fall. Make the leap without anxiety. God will catch and heal you. And Monica kept leaping in faith on behalf of Augustine. Monica's tears also show not only how she's like Our Lady, but how she's like Christ. God the Father saw Jesus on the cross crying out for the conversion of souls. He pitied Monica because he saw the marks of the passion and the cries of her heart, the cries of his son. Just as Jesus bled on the cross and said, I thirst, so Monica every day was saying to the Lord, to the Father, I thirst for the conversion of Augustine. St. Augustine says, she wept over me as a person dead, but to be revived by you. In her mind, she was offering me before you on a beer, so that you could say, as you said to the widow, widow's son, young man, I say to you, arise. And then he would recover and begin to speak, and you would restore him to his mother. It was the gravity and weight of love, divinely ordered love, a love dwelling only in wanting God's will for her beloved son, that Monica continued on this pursuit for Augustine's salvation, and in the end, she won his conversion. Such pure intentions and long-suffering melted the heart of God. Her love for Augustine was so pure and so holy and you know, all tears come from the heart, but only pure tears reach the, the heart of God. And it's interesting that, you know, Augustine cried many times in his life, and he talks about it in the, in the confessions, but his tears weren't pure and holy like his mother's until after she dies. Only after she dies does his tears have that purity of love that her tears had all of those years. Because only in the purity of love, where the lover solely seeks the salvation of the beloved, can tears of God be shed. In other situations, tears are shed, tainted with a darkness of self-love. Sometimes Monica shed, you know, impure tears over, not impure, um, less than perfect tears over Augustine, right? So for example, when he left for Rome, she cried because as Augustine said, as mothers do, she loved to have me with her. Those are human tears, right? They're not perfectly selfless. They're not bad. They're just not perfect. But even if they were stained, however lightly as they may have been with a selfish desire to be with her son physically, as Augustine suggests, we can be sure that the core of Monica's longing was the salvation of his soul. And if God would have said, no, you have to be separate from him for him to be with me, she would have given him up. That's the kind of woman he was. 
And this entire book of the Confessions is full of examples of Monica's radiant, pure, and holy tears, so selfless, just longing for the salvation of her son. The tears of other people in the book, especially those of Augustine, are not pure and holy like his mother's. They cried for things of the world. And one place Augustine describes the tears of men who instead of giving up the world for God, turned from the monastic life and returned to the old ways of life. Here they wept for themselves. They offered their friends devout congratulations and commended themselves to their prayers. And then dragging their hearts along the ground, they went off into the palace and wept for themselves. That's more selfish, right? They cried because they loved the things of the world more than the things of God. Augustine also shed selfish tears. He cried when his mistress had to be sent away. And one cannot pretend to believe that he was really attached to her for anything more than a sexual relationship because she was quickly replaced by another mistress. And he cried for himself when she left. For his lack of physical comfort, he said, the woman with whom I habitually slept was torn away from my side because she was a hindrance to my marriage. My heart, which was deeply attached, was cut and wounded and left in a trail of blood, as I was not a lover of marriage, but a slave of lust. And I procured another woman, of course, not as a wife. So that was his selfish, evil tears. You can see him in contrast with those selfless tears of Monica, right? He said, only tears were sweet to me, and in my soul's delight, weeping replaced my friend. That's what he said when his friend died. He might have loved him, but those were still kind of selfish tears, right? And he was also crying because his friend had converted to Catholicism. And so he felt abandoned in his pagan ways, right? And his aloneness. And he also cried when his mother dies, but these were approaching pure tears. He loved his mother, not just his mother, but because his mother brought him to God. Those are pure tears right? Those are pure tears. That was a greater experience of true love than Augustine had ever had because he was loving the person who brought him to God, right? And as he cried at his mother's death, he regretted his tears because he knew that she was now with God and he should be happy for her, right? He recognized he shouldn't cry over things of nature, but only over things like the salvation of souls, right? He said after his mother died, I knew what pressure lay upon my heart and because it caused me such sharp displeasure to see how much power these human frailties had over me, though they are a necessary part of the order we have to endure and are the lot of human condition. So he clung to his tears and offered them to God as a prayer he had learned that from his mother who had done that for many, many years, right? And he goes on to explain, I was glad to weep before you about Monica and for Monica, about myself and for myself. This is after she died. Now I let flow the tears which I had held back so that they ran as freely as they wished. My heart rested upon them and it reclined upon them because it was your ears that were there, not those of some human critic who would put a proud interpretation on my weeping. Let anyone who wishes to read and interpret as he pleases. If he finds fault that I wept for my mother for a fraction of an hour, the mother who had died before my eyes and who had wept for me, that I might live before your eyes, let him not mock me. He cries because of the beauty of her love. They're almost joyful tears. He cries because of the divine love in her soul. And the tears that he shed at her death quickly turned to tears um, for the salvation of souls. He says, I pour out to you, our God, another kind of tears. They flow from a spirit struck hard by considering the perils threatening every soul that dies in Adam. So he, we can see here how the tears of Monica gave birth to Augustine, the faith he needed to cry pure tears like her own. It's very beautiful. The son becomes like the mother.
And again, I, you know, I draw that reflection from those words of St. Ambrose. It cannot be that a son of these tears should perish. Because of the tears of Monica, Augustine converted. He said, where she was, you heard her. And where I was, you had mercy on me. She drew God's attention to the needs of Augustine's heart. And in the end, Monica's grief was turned to joy. When writing about his baptism, Augustine says, Water of grace, baptism, was to wash me clean and to dry the rivers flowing from my mother's eyes, which daily before you irrigated the soul, the soil beneath her face. Once again, when Monica looked at her newborn son in the font of baptism, she trembled with love and awe, for God had granted her far more than she had been praying for in her unhappy and tearful groans. Again, he says, mother and child were finally together, united in the faith, resting in the palace of undisturbed quietness, where love is not deserted if it does not itself depart. It was only in Augustine's baptism that Monica finally could rest in the Lord. And so she died, right? St. Teresa of Avila writes in her autobiography, Love draws forth love. And it, in some ways, it was the love of Monica for God that drew forth God's love for Monica and the people that she loved. And so Monica's love for God drew forth God's love for Augustine even more than he already did. And drew forth love from Augustine's heart for God. Love draws forth love. Love in one person is infectious in kindling it in another. So again, Monica drew forth love from the heart of God in grace for Augustine and from the heart of Augustine for God. St. Augustine says that his mother was a mouthpiece of God. When he writes, Then those words, were they but yours which you were chanting in my ears through my mother, your faithful servant? You were speaking to me through her. He could hear that voice of God through that longing of Monica calling him back to the truth. And eventually, Monica surrendered to the providence of God and it was used by that ves as a vessel of love for God to Augustine. Jesus said, no man is a greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friend. And Monica laid down all she was as an offering for the salvation of her son's soul. She willingly suffered and offered this to God as a plea for her son. Her awesome love of God gave her the faith, hope, and endurance she needed to press on when everything was hopeless. Eventually, her love of God and her love for her son drew forth love for God from the heart of her son. She extracted this love from his heart through her example and prayers. As a voice in the wilderness of Augustine's life, Monica called him home. The gardener of souls, being God, used the tears of this woman to water the faith of her son. St. Monica carried her son with her own faith until a desire to cling to God sprung forth in Augustine's heart. St. Monica's heart must surely have danced with the angels the day that her son finally prayed, Enable me to love you with all of my strength that I may clasp your hand with all of my heart. Amen. So St. Monica and St. Augustine, pray for us. Now at the end of this reflection on prayer and Monica and Augustine, I want to pray a beautiful litany that I have. And it's to Our Lady of Consolation, St. Augustine and St. Monica. And we'll pray this in a special way for the people that you think are hopeless. That your heart is longing in a pure and holy way for their conversion or their correction for um, a grace for them that seems impossible for now. Lord of mercy, Christ of mercy, Lord of mercy, Christ hear us, Christ graciously hear us. God the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. 
Mary, our mother, mother of Jesus, pray for us. Mary, mother of consolation, pray for us. Mary, source of hope, pray for us. Mary, refuge of sinners, pray for us. Mary, the guiding star of our lives, pray for us. Mary, source of strength in our weakness, pray for us. Mary, source of light in our darkness, pray for us. Mary, source of consolation in our sorrow, pray for us. Mary, source of victory in our temptations, pray for us. Mary, who leads us to Jesus, pray for us. Mary, who keeps us with Jesus, pray for us. Mary, who redeems us through Jesus, pray for us. Mary, Mother of Consolation, our patroness, pray for us. St. Augustine, triumph of divine grace, pray for us. St. Augustine, so faithful to grace, pray for us. St. Augustine, glowing with pure love of God, pray for us. St. Augustine, filled with zeal for God's glory, pray for us. St. Augustine, bright star in the firmament of the church, pray for us. St. Augustine, great and humble, pray for us. St. Augustine, dauntless defender of the faith, pray for us. St. Augustine, vanquisher of heresy, pray for us. St. Augustine, prince of bishops and doctors, Pray for us. St. Augustine, our Father, pray for us. St. Monica, devout mother of St. Augustine, pray for us. St. Monica, whose prayers won Augustine from sin, pray for us. St. Monica, whose prayers gave Augustine to God, pray for us. St. Monica, patterned for wives, pray for us. St. Monica, model of mothers and mother of saints, pray for us. St. Monica, exemplar of widows, Pray for us. St. Monica, oops, devoted to prayer, pray for us. St. Monica, patient in trials, pray for us. St. Monica, resigned in sorrow, pray for us. St. Monica, happy in death, pray for us. St. Monica, devoted child of Mary, mother of consolation, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, O Lord. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of Consolation. Pray for us, O Holy Father, St. Augustine. Pray for us, O Holy Mother, St. Monica, that we be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all consolation, Grant to thy servants that joyfully venerating thy most pure mother Mary as our lady of consolation, we may be consoled by her in our sorrow, fortified in our trials through life, and in dying may merit the ineffable consolation of heaven for all eternity. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Please consider supporting these Patreon, these, um, podcasts through becoming a monthly Patreon donor. They cost money. <laughs> and um, it helps me to be able to continue to do this, to get the resources I need to pull all this together. Sometimes it's books, sometimes it's microphones, sometimes it's the internet. I've had to up my internet because it wasn't working. Um, so anything that you give helps with this, along with the projects that I do with my books and my art and my music. Um, both here in the U.S. and then abroad in um, Africa and in the Middle East and now into Central and South America. And so um, please consider joining our Patreon family. Um, you can go and get information about donations if you go to my website. And if you want information on my vocation and my ministry in general, you're interested in my books, um, go see my website, which is Mary. Um, www.marykloskafiat.com. So it's M A R Y K L O S K A F I A T.com. And thank you for keeping me in my, your prayers, and you are in mine as well. God bless you. <laughs>